Hi, so welcome to um, the last, well, I'm standing in front of, of Adam. Well, I'm just going to that side. <laughs> so, <laughs> so welcome to our last session in today's Big Tech Day. And today it's a great, great honor because we have Adam Schostack here as a speaker at the Big Tech Day. And for those who don't know Adam, Adam has a long, long history in the field of IT security. He has been working for Microsoft for almost a decade, and there he was responsible for things like the secure development lifecycle uh, tool. And I think recently he now runs his own startup focusing on, on consulting, I guess. And he's also an affiliate uh, professor at the University of Washington. And yeah, what Adam is mostly known for is that he wrote uh, this incredible, awesome book, which is like the standard textbook if you want to know anything about threat modeling. But um, he's also very active in the in the community. He is one of the authors of the Threat Modeling Manifesto, and he's also an emeritus member of the CVE Advisory Board. And one topic from for which Adam is particularly important for TNG is that he is actually the inventor of the Elevation of Privilege uh, Threat Modeling card game, which is like an oh, <laughs> and someone is just showing your cards. And which is like um, 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 a gamification oh, yeah. <laughs> approach to threat modeling. And this is something we do a lot in TNG. And we are, th we are very thankful for Adam for just inventing the game. And so we are very, very proud that you're speaking here. And so I'm very curious what you tell us about threat modeling in 2022. Well, wonderful. Thank you for the, the kind introduction. And as, as you've said, I am known for threat modeling. And so people come to me and ask, what's changing in threat modeling? What's new? What's different? And so I'm going to skip over this slide because you, you covered all of it. And when people ask me what's changing in threat modeling, I think of threat modeling as a way of seeing the world. And so I ask what's changing in the world. And so most obviously, um, we're continuing to live in a global pandemic. There's a war happening in Ukraine in a way that I didn't think we'd ever see again. We have things like the Digital Markets Act changing the way we create and conceive of digital products. And we have some silly things like, I never thought I'd say this sentence, an IoT robot vacuum ha vulnerability let hackers spy on people using it. Um, in the last couple of days, we've seen news in San Francisco that robot car outages are blocking traffic in San Francisco. Um, and then one of my favorite headlines of all time, I'm going to disappear for a second so you can see my, the edge of my slide, but Dutch spies caught Russian hackers on video because workplace monitoring allowed them to see into the rooms where the Russians were hacking into the CIA, and the cameras were so good that they could read the screens to see what they were hacking into. And so the world is changing in all of these ways and these ways change how we think about the products that we're building. And so let me, when I think about what's changing in the world, there's a lot of changes in the software world as well. And so in 2020, at the national level, the European Union sanctioned Russians and Chinese and North Koreans for hacking. The CISO of Uber has been criminally charged for covering up a, oops, you can't see the, the has been criminally charged for covering up a breach. 
The OWASP top 10, which is no longer forthcoming, says that threat modeling is no longer optional. And I think I'm uh, covering my slide. I'm gonna move myself up here so that you can see me a little bit better. Um, and of course we had Log4j and the Computer Safety Review Board here in the United States issued its first report. It's an interesting new institution. They issued a report yesterday on Log4j. And so I wanna talk about a few things. I wanna to talk today about development in the world of COVID. And I wanna talk a lot about threat modeling and they overlap. And so let me start with the world in which we live where we have COVID impacting the way in which we develop software. And so, I'm gonna shrink myself down so you can see. So the first thing to say is that I really believe that everyone is exhausted with stress and illness. And this applies not only to us as engineers, it's our customers, it's our prospects, it's our employees. These events are deeply emotionally impactful. And a lot of times people will talk about, we've been working from home for a long time. And I like to think of this as a global catastrophe in which we've lost millions of people, frankly, and we're getting work done as we can. And we hear a lot, and I, you know, Christoph was nice enough to turn his laptop around so I can see the room. We talk a lot about return to office, and here in Seattle, at least, we're seeing deep resistance to the idea that people are going to return to an office. This puts a layer of stress underneath what we are all doing that we have to acknowledge, we have to think about. And one concrete impact is that teams are distributed now. What used to happen at the water cooler is different. We used to have implicit and informal communication and a lot of that is gone. People are more cognizant of what they type than what they say. I know I edit my Slack messages. I assume many of you do. And so these changes change the way we engage with what we're delivering. And so development teams need more communication tools. We need frameworks for thinking about how we do things. And we need assurance and reassurance up and down across the product, across how we're working. And security features, as well as security properties are becoming more important to what we develop. And to me, you won't be too surprised to know that this means we need more threat modeling. And so the four question framework for threat modeling still works. I'm gonna just put myself in the corner here. The four question framework, if you're not familiar with it, what are we working on? What can go wrong? What are we gonna do about it? And did we do a good job? Are the way that I like to organize my thinking about threat modeling, these questions help me engage with the wide variety of different things that I engage with. And this still works. And it's important to understand that because as so many things are changing, having some stability is really helpful. And so the rest of this talk, what I'm gonna talk about, what are we working on and how are we working on it and how the world of cyber is changing, including some thoughts about Agile. And I'm gonna spend a good deal of time on the question of what can go wrong, how threats are evolving, talk about stride, talk about machine learning, talk about conflict as ways of thinking about the question of what can go wrong in 2022. And so let me start with agile. Things are changing, things are move, things are changing quickly. One of the things I hear all the time is that threat modeling is this waterfally process. It's big, it's complex, it's heavyweight. 
And I really believe that threat modeling is no more inherently waterfall than Ruby. We can do it in a CI CD world. We can do it in an agile world. And as security people, my, 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 my tribe in security often gets angry at the fast cycles that we live in. And I think it's a mistake. I think fast cycles are great. I think they're amazing for security. And that the security people often focus on the risk of these fast cycles and ignore the benefits, which are that controls and quality improvements to address threats ship faster than they used to. And so the overall delivery of security, like the overall delivery of features or product quality, gets better in an agile world when we engage with it. So people ask me, how does, how does this work? And the first thing I wanna say is that the skills we bring to bear, the tasks we do are similar. We ask, what are we working on? What can go wrong? What are we gonna do about it? And we scope and change the deliverables in a way that works in waterfall or works in agile. So in the agile world where we're delivering in small increments, we threat model in small increments. And when we're delivering in larger waterfall increments, we threat model in those larger increments. And another piece is I, I do a lot of training work and people always ask me, when do we stop? And they're always surprised at my answer, which is stop early. And I've learned this from my colleagues who do agile development, who enjoy shipping small increments and asking, does this meet our needs? Is this enough? What is the next most important thing? And when we ask that, as we threat model, we'll find, hey, this diagram is good enough. This list of threats is good enough, or it's not. But stopping early to consider, does this meet our needs, is something that I've learned from people in the Agile world. And bringing it into threat modeling really works wonderfully. Now, I said the deliverables and scoping aligned to each. And let me talk about that in detail. And the next slide has a bunch of detail. And so down the, down the left-hand column here is the four questions. System models, what are we working on? Finding threats, what can go wrong? Fixes, what are we going to do about it? The middle column is waterfall, where we're focused on documents. And the right-hand column is agile, where we're focused more on bugs and conversations. So for example, when we're threat modeling in waterfall, we have a big complex scope. When we're threat modeling in agile, our scope is tiny, this sprints change. And so where we build system diagrams and essays in waterfall threat modeling, we do less of that in agile. We treat the big picture in ad as security debt, like any other technical debt that we want to think about. We use the same mechanisms for finding threats, but we aim that at the in-sprint code in Agile. And so the mechanisms work well, and we just adjust them to fit the way we're developing. Excuse me for one second. Sorry about that. So another question people ask is how do we get started? And I like to align, work the features that are being built, develop your skills, build value, and worry about the big picture. I often see security people coming into an agile project and they want to build a big context diagram of the system as a whole. And it, it leads to conflict is the short version. But there's a, there's a thing we can do in 2022, which is GDPR requires us to think about the whole of the system. And if we use that, if we leverage that, those data flows for threat modeling, 
we can get a lot of benefit. I'm going to skip forward a little bit. Um, one thing, one thing that's important here is if we're if our goal is to have a conversation about what we're working on, going to the whiteboard, playing elevation of privilege. I'm thrilled that you all use it. Um, being really agile and engaging with the people in front of us can be great. And a lot of teams will say, bring me, a, bring me a diagram and we'll do a threat model together. And when you say the words, bring me a diagram, what's often implied is we're going to do a review and sign off. We're not going to make changes to that diagram because creating these diagrams is work. People want their work that's going to be reviewed and looked at to be high quality. And so I see this dynamic, and maybe it's happening for you, maybe it's happening with your customers, where you say, bring me a diagram, show me what you're working on. And all of a sudden, you end up in this conflict situation where you thought you were going to brainstorm the people who are bringing you a diagram think you're going to sign off on it. And this conflict erupts seemingly from nowhere. And I want to focus your, your attention on that phrase, bring me a diagram, as a generator of conflict and a generator of needless conflict. Um, and so a little Monty Python for you, a little Monty Python with me moving out of the way. If... If you want to be this person who says, what is your name? What is your quest? Where is your threat model? And we're going to stop you from getting to production. Ooh, look, I can move myself here. Here I am over the, over the little guy. Um, then you can do this, but this is not a collaborative model. And I really like collaborative models because I think they help us ship better stuff. Um, going to skip ahead here. So let me turn my attention to the question of what can go wrong. Um, there's a lot of what can go wrong in supply chain, and I'm not going to talk about this today, but it's becoming more and more clear that a lot of the answers to what can go wrong are, we picked up this open source library it's free, not like beer, not like speech, but it's free like a puppy. Um, we've taken this free puppy and now we have to take care of it. And so really we're seeing a lot of people start to think about what is the effect of open source? How do we think about the debt and the obligation we take on as we bring in a new open source library? I'm going to talk about Stride and how Stride is changing, a little bit on machine learning, a little bit on kill chains, and a little on conflict. And I'm going to try and make sure I leave good time for questions in here as well. So Stride, people often say, wow, Stride is old. It turned 21 two years ago. Um, and so they think we need something new and different. I think Stride is still great. Stride remains my go-to if you're not, well, since you're familiar with Elevation of Privilege, you'll be familiar with the mnemonic. It still works. There's new details. We'll talk about those new details. So for example, in spoofing, there's spoofing of package names. There's GPS spoofing. There's spoofing phone authentications. There's audio and video spoofing. Wow, there's a lot of new spoofing in the world. But still, it fits into Stride. You can think about this as you use Stride to think about what can go wrong. So spoofing package names in repositories. A uh, researcher named Alex Bersan made $130,000 in bug bounties last year. Um, spoofing package names, having them drawn into people's build pipelines and having them execute code. It was an awesome set of attacks. Um, they're spoofing of source code using Unicode, RLO, and other tricks so that the source you're looking at doesn't contain the things that you think it does. 
And so this was a really cool set of attacks. Um, forced GitHub to change the way they display code. Spoofing of GPS is now a commercial reality. We've seen it in, um, in Shanghai. And so we're going to see more GPS spoofing. It's becoming less expensive. It's becoming more practical. Um, and so this thing that we thought was a source of truth is less of a source of truth than it was. Um, they're spoofing a phone authentication with SMS and calls. US government regulators are saying move away from phones or move away from text messages as a source of authentication. Um, SIM porting, phone porting attacks are, I think, more of a problem in the United States where we don't have a national identity infrastructure the way people sometimes do in Europe. And so we see a lot of attacks where someone will walk into a store and say, uh, you know, I'm Christoph Nyhoff, please, um, this is my new phone, please move my phone number to this phone. And the store helpfully cooperates so I can now get Christoph's phone messages. It's great if I'm an attacker, not so great um, if, if you're a defender. There's spoofing of facial recognition. Uh, five years ago, six years ago, MasterCard announced pay with a selfie and an Israeli threat intelligence firm reports that there are now selfies in dark webs. The FBI and MI5 recently announced that they're seeing deep fakes in use in job interviews and other scams. And so, these spoofs of facial recognition are growing in quality. They're growing in ease of deployment. And so when we think about spoofing, spoofing of live video is now a thing that is starting to be possible. Spoofing audio, a few weeks ago, Amazon announced that they could take a minute of audio and um, have Alexa speak in that voice. There's a lot of use of voice as authentication, either speak a passphrase, and we'll check not only the passphrase, but your voice, but also background authentication to make sure the voice stays the same throughout a call to a call center. And Google last year announced Google Duplex, a system that allowed um, Google to make phone calls on your behalf and do real-time interaction. And if we mix voice, off, voice spoofing, voice cloning, and Google Duplex, we're going to see convincingly faked attacks with voices of people you know. And this is going to be exceptionally scary. Um, I can see somebody spoofing a phone call and saying, hey, honey, I'm trying to get my Netflix thing. I'm traveling. What's up? Um, what's the Netflix password? And of course, humans being humans, your Netflix password is not only your Netflix password. It's also your work password, your bank password, and other things. And so I think spoofed audio is going to break a lot of our mental models of how we authenticate. We've got spoofing of videos. Um, I mentioned this is getting better and better. The tools are easier, it's faster. And so spoofing as a, as a set of threats is exploding and impacting the ways we want to authenticate people. Tampering, we're seeing physical access attacks as we get more and more IoT devices. Many people rent out a home or rent someone else's home via services like Airbnb. Cars are getting accessed by their owners, um, whoever their owner happens to be. A couple of days ago, I saw a headline that BMW is going to allow seat heaters as a service. Apparently, it's cheaper to put the seat heating mechanisms into every car 
than to have some cars with and some cars without. And so now we've got people who are motivated to save $18 a month by rooting their car, running their own code on it, and turn on the seat heaters. Um, so often we think of small device IoT, but cars are now big device IoT. And um, the people who are building this often build software. Taplock is a company that makes locks, um, IoT startup. And it turns out that these locks, you could just pry the back off of them um, with a screwdriver because it was software people and they didn't think about the physical attacks in the way that people with a long history of building locks think about physical security. Repudiation. Repudiation is growing in interesting ways. There was this set of stories a year ago where people were getting seed packets in the mail. And I actually got some in the mail. They were from China, China Post. They were marked as a packet of earrings. What was going on? Apparently it was review fraud where people were sending these excuse me, shipping fraud, where people were just sending out these packets of seeds so that when someone claimed, I didn't get, I never ordered this or I never got this, there was a service available that would give you a receipt that would give the scammer a receipt from China Post so they could submit that to Amazon and say, oh no, we shipped this package. And they were just shipping packages all over the place because they needed receipts that said, we shipped a package to Adam at this address. And so the, everyone in the U.S. was getting these packages. And it was, a, it was part of a complex process to be able to produce documentation that said, yep, we shipped a package to that address. Also, there was a story about police officers playing copyrighted music when they were misbehaving so that YouTube would take down the copyrighted music and the video of them um, misbehaving. And they were telling people, YouTube will take this down as they were playing Beatles music. <laughs> the world is a surprising place. Um, let's see, I'm going to skip over this. Information disclosure is getting better and better. Location services are in everything um, these days, and it's leading to weird behavior. Um, so over here on the right, you can see a tree that is apparently growing mobile phones. And this is right outside an Amazon distribution center. And the thing that's motivating this is that drivers want to be the next one in line to um, pick up the packages and deliver them for Amazon. And so they leave a bunch of cheap Android phones tied to the tree. And so they're right outside the door and they accept the, the job to pick up the package. And so Amazon is driving in, is creating a market for location spoofing. Um, information disclosure, there are sensors in everything. There's a barometer in your iPhone. You can download a barometer app and you can take your phone, you can move it up and down and you can see you can, it is sensitive enough to note different pressure at different heights. And this is part of figuring out what, how high up you are to improve the quality of your location reading. Um, as you sit there and you type on your phone, this is a drum. Um, and the drum hits the accelerometer and someone with accelerometer access can figure out what you're typing on the phone. There are ultrasound beacons that help disclose your location. 
the the the, the piece of cheese that's here is not here because of the cheese. The piece of cheese is here because some criminal posted that picture and it was high quality enough that the police could read his fingerprints, pull his pull the fingerprint card, figure out who the criminal was who was posting to a underworld forum and pick him up and convict him on the basis of his fingerprints. And so sensors in the things around us are disclosing all sorts of information at a rate that is hard to fathom. Um, denial of service used to be all about compute storage and bandwidth. Now it's about batteries. I have home security cameras that run for six months on a pair of AA batteries. Um, it's also about money and sometimes it's about roads. Um, this, this was an interesting story. You could buy a motorcycle airbag vest, which is a subscription. And if you stop paying or if the company gets hacked, your airbag vest no longer works. Um, and then this story, this just, this blows my mind. Um, the, these robot cars are jamming up San Francisco. And apparently the reason for this is they lost contact with the mothership. I don't know about you, if I were designing a robot car, I would want it to have all of its critical processing locally so that a cell phone outage of this form that we saw in Canada in the last few days doesn't cause my car to stop working, but I'm weird like that. Um, elevation of privilege, we continue to see um, hardware attacks, side channel attacks, and the world of IoT, it's difficult to figure out how all of the IoT devices in the world work. And we're seeing them used as tools of domestic abuse. Thinking about how do I safely reset my device when one party or the other may be um, either trying to get rid of the abuser or continue that position of power. This is a use case which is relatively low frequency but very, very high impact. And I think it's important as we think about threat modeling to think about this use and make sure that our devices are not being abused in this way. So switching from Stride, Stride is one of many tools that's available to us. Machine learning is something that's being threat modeled. And I'll talk briefly about that. I'll talk briefly about kill chains as an emerging tool. I'll talk briefly about conflict because I wanna make sure that I leave some time for questions as well at the end. So one of the biggest new tools for threat modeling is our kill chains. Kill, a lot of people think about kill chains from a forensic perspective, an incident response perspective, and I think they're amazing tools for threat modeling. MITRE's attack is really powerful for helping people think about what can go wrong with regards to an operational system that they're building. There's a site unified kill chain that thinks about a meta model of kill chains that they all have some initial foothold, some network propagation, some action acts on objection, acts, blah, 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 excuse me, actions on objectives. And this is a helpful way to think about kill chains as a as a model that's easy to remember that my attacker goes through these three stages and then there's details that we can think about. And thinking about this, how are we going to protect, detect and respond to those things as we construct a system? 
um, as I said, I think kill chains are an important new thing that I've seen emerging over the last few years as a technique for threat modeling and answering what can go wrong. Machine learning, threat modeling for machine learning, there's adversarial machine learning, which is focused on convincing someone else's machine learning to work to an attacker's goal by attacking the system with traditional attacks, by attacking training data. And sometimes we think mag machine learning is just magic and it just sort of works and we forget that it's code and it has bugs and those bugs are exploitable in all sorts of fun ways. Um, I will make these slides available. You are not expected to remember this, but there's a lot of good work on how to threat model machine learning systems. You don't have to start from a blank slate. You, you can go to sites like Microsoft and the Berryville Institute of Machine Learning, and there's some really interesting starting points that help us answer the question, what can go wrong? What are we gonna do about it? When what we're working on is a machine learning system. I wanna talk about conflict in threat modeling because what goes wrong is not just at the technical layer. As societies move online and our entire lives exist in these technologically mediated ways, attackers are making use of this in all sorts of ways and, the, and threat modeling can help us think about this. And so one way I find to think about the threats is not just the threats to the systems that we're working on, but looking at the way systems amplify, magnify, and allow these threats to become manifest. And my examples involve politics, and I don't want to focus on the politics of these examples, but people are passionately motivated by some of the political events in the world, and as a result, they find ways to use these systems to make points about the politics of the world. And so they're useful for thinking about what's happening in the technology. And that's what I'd like us to focus on. Um, so some of you may remember um, Robin Hood. Robin Hood is an American retail um, investment site. And um, six months, nine months ago, give or take, they decided on Reddit that they were going to boost the price of this uh, little, little company called GameStop. And GameStop lets you resell your video games. And they had a sufficient effect on the financial markets that their CEO had to get in front of the House Committee on Financial Services um, that the, gov the US government was investigating because they, they were shaking the markets as a result of a set of political arguments that I don't even remember. Um, and it was, it was built on Reddit. It was magnified through this system or through this broker called Robinhood. And these sorts of stories magnify the need or amplify the need for thinking about this. A few days ago, um, there was a news story about U.S. Supreme Court Justice Brent Kavanaugh who was apparently chased out of a Morton Steakhouse. And if you go to the Morton Steakhouse in downtown Washington, D.C., on Yelp, a review site, you see this message. This business recently received increased public attention 
which often means people come to this page to post their view on the news, blah, blah, blah. We've temporarily disabled the posting of content to this page. Um, the thing I want to take away from this is not about Morton's Steakhouse. It's not about the U.S. Supreme Court. It's that this page is an engineered response to a set of events that Yelp is finding happen sufficiently frequently that they need to think about this as a product issue, right? They made a choice to create this. And if you look at the web page, and I've been watching Yelp's engineering response to this for the last four or five years, I've got a whole series of We've disabled this. We're reviewing this. We're, they, they keep changing this. There's a product manager whose job it is to manage public attention issues. And they're trying to balance a set of competing interests. And I bring this up because the four-question framework works for conflict. I'm going to, to get my, uh, there we are. Um, so when we say, what are we working on? What we're working on is a system that has user-generated content or social aspects. What can go wrong is not just exploit, it's conflict. And what are we going to do about it? The intuitive measures fail. We, we need to catalog and study defenses. And the reason I'm bringing up the Yelp example is because, oops, is because we can look at this and we can see that at some point, Yelp felt a need to add this sentence. Please note, we apply the same policy regardless of the business and regardless of the topic at issue. Um, that's a string that a product manager wrote that's been EB tested, that's been internationalized. I, you know, I believe that Yelp works in Germany. So there's a German version of this page, right? They're spending engineering resources on this. Because, and so I catalog, I study these defenses because to the question of, did we do a good job? Not really, not often enough. And so, for example, there's a, there's a fix which people often announce, which is we're going to force people to use real names. Trolls get more hostile. This, this is a strong reproducible result is that people get worse when you force them to use their real names. And so um, the, the fixes for these things are less obvious. And, and I want to mention very specifically, the, the fixes here are a mix of the technical and the interpersonal. And so we as engineers need to talk to sociologists, psychologists, experts in human behavior, not just think about this as a technical problem. We also need a catalog of design patterns. And so I maintain this on GitHub, pull requests welcome to help people as they encounter these problems for the first time, say, oh, here's a set of advice. Here's a set of things that people have looked at in the past. Because we can ask, what can go wrong? What are we going to do about it? And did we do a good job? And we can benefit from the experience of others. So to summarize threats a little bit, the instances of stride are evolving. Kill chains have emerged as an incredible technique to help us think about our operational systems. 
and conflict is looming. But the threats, the, the way in which we answer the question, or the question, excuse me, the question of what can go wrong absolutely still helps us in 2022. It will still help us in 2023 and beyond. So some takeaways for you, and then I will take some questions. The fundamental skills of threat modeling remain important. The simple fact is the systems we engineer um, continue to be attacked. The details of what we're working on, how we work on it, the threats, these are all changing. Conflict modeling is going to become an increasingly important thing. And so as we go forward, when people ask me what's changing in the world, what's changing in threat modeling, I think about what's changing in the world, and I believe that we can take it on effectively. Some resources for you. You know, Christoph was nice enough to hold up my book at showstack.org slash resources and slash blog. I've got a whole slew of threat modeling resources available to you. I blog about threat modeling on an ongoing basis. So with that, I want to say thank you for, for listening. Thank you for your attention. And if you have questions, I am happy to take them now. I am happy to get email from you. Um, so yeah, again, thank you. And yeah, what, what can I answer for you? Adam, thank you. Thank you very much. And maybe the people in the audience don't know, doesn't, I don't know it, but Adam is living in the West Coast of the US. So it's still pretty early in, in his day today. So and this is coffee. Best, it's coffee. <laughs> so he agreed to talk to us. So thank you very much for that. So I have questions. So hi, Adam. I'm Johannes. Hi. Johannes Epke. I'm uh, very grateful that you had the time today to come to us. And thank you for the very interesting talk. Um, I'm I've actually, actually got a question which is slightly orthogonal and has to do with the card game you, uh, you came up with and designed, which is, I think, a very clever way to package up a checklist into something more, much more appealing. And um, I was wondering if you had some ideas how you would... So I've got a, a master's student who's trying to design a game that tries to do a similar thing for... Um, incident response and incident handling of incident uh, post incident activities finding out what you know what you know how you could respond to that do you have any ideas that you maybe didn't manage to get into elevation of privilege or what you could uh, give some hints to that yeah so I, I i love game questions i love i love building games and so first I maintain a catalog of games for security at showstack.org slash games. And so there's a lot of people who have explored this idea. And the key for me is to figure out what the learning goal of the game is and to select a mechanism that amplifies and helps with the learning goal. You're right. Elevation of privilege is a fancied up checklist. And I stole a game called Spades. Um, Elevation of Privilege Under the Hood is, is a bidding game called Spades. Because I didn't want to design a game mechanism. I wanted to focus on that learning goal. And there's a lovely little book called The White Box Set for Game Design, which is full of mechanisms that you can steal and borrow. Um, so come up with a learning goal, find mechanisms that support that learning goal um, are, are the keys for me to developing a new game. Does that help? Thank you. Thank you. Are there any more questions in the audience or maybe on Slack? Hi, uh, so 
thank you for the talk. I enjoyed it very much. Um, one question regarding conflict modeling. So it seems to me like this is kind of dependent on culture, like it will differ between different regions of the world. And so how do we deal with that? Well, when we also consider that like the tools we build are being used more and more internationally. And maybe also like you said, you had some guidelines for people who are just getting started with that. Are you covering like these things in there? It is a great question. And my resources, the resources that I look at tend to be resources in English um, for the hopeful, some perhaps obvious reason that English is my, is my mother tongue and my ability to read in other languages is somewhat limited. The, and so I don't have great resources not to be exclusionary, but because they rarely come to my attention. Uh, I do think that the the localization, the the cultural engagement, you know, for example, I know we have a talk at Black Hat this summer about um, election disinformation in South America. And so there there are important differences that that we're going to shine some spotlight on there and so i would encourage you to to compare and contrast i would love to learn more about this okay thank you any there hi so um i'm audible yes okay yes. so uh i'm interested in how did you balance for so for threat modeling how do you balance um abstract uh threats that you just dream up with proof of concepts and real threats that cause real damage because if you only uh, go to one end of these spectrum then then you are really limited so you have to find a kind of balance i guess so how how, how do you deal with that so it's a great question, um, and and let me start answering by saying one of the really weird things about threat modeling is that sometimes the things we dream up that seem out there but we address them never come to pass because we address them, and so they seem like they were theoretical, but because we addressed them, we've actually improved things. And so the, the ensuring that we stay practical is, is often a matter of having a diverse team, being able to say this is important or that's important because of this lived experience or because I've seen this in the wild, I've seen this thing happen. There's a there's a relationship between threat modeling and the rest of engineering work where people will pick up and say that threat I don't think it's worth fixing or I do and for me the important thing from threat modeling is we identify possible future harms so I don't love to say that's unrealistic too early. I like to develop it. I like to say, here's, we're gonna put it on the list. We're gonna figure out if we need to do something about it later on. And that can include, is it blue sky or highly likely? Is it expensive to fix? Maybe we'll fix a blue sky thing that's inexpensive because it's inexpensive and we'd like to cut off the idea. Or maybe it's real and we know that it's going to happen, but it's so expensive to deal with that we're going to deal with it later when it's more visible. And so 
the important, again, the important thing to me is that we've identified it, we write it down, and we manage it like everything else that we might work on as part of product delivery. Thank you. Next question. Thank you very much. Um, you had a great point that uh, you need to balance the the uh, the, uh, the threats uh, on how realistic they are. Um, but again, when we, uh, we are living in a world where there's increasing conflict, increasing conflict between nations, and because all the systems get uh, uh, a part of uh, everything moves online, everything is part of this global eco ecosystem. So does this actually change the uh, equation when you uh, you have to incorporate uh, uh, basically nation states as your adver uh, uh, adversaries into your threat model for basically every kind of application because every kind of application is part of uh, 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 yeah is part of their uh, their goal. Yes. Um, so. So the first thing to say about nation states as attackers is they have A teams and they have B teams. And the A teams are really clever and they do interesting new things and the B teams use phishing. And the B teams are often shockingly effective. They're bigger they're than, the, than, the, than the really elite teams. And yes, conflict means that we have to think about things in a different way than we did 10 years ago. For, for example, um, the NotPetya attack, we often forget that that was implemented via the Ukrainian Ministry of Finance's tax application, which companies had to use if they were doing business in Ukraine, they had to download this Windows app from the ministry and run it. And the Russians broke in and installed malware that ran around the world. This means that our engineering budgets for defense have to change, right? We, we have to take these things differently seriously than we were able to five years ago, 10 years ago. And I think this is a complex societal problem really because I, I don't want to fund fighting off foreign governments. That seems like the wrong thing for a private company to have to do. And it seems hard to avoid. So are we gonna have a more societally organized response? Um, in theory, I, I would hope so, um, but it doesn't seem to be happening very much. And so to, to your question, yes, we now have to adjust our budgets and adjust our expectations a little bit relative to where they were. Okay, so there's another question. Hi, I'm Klaus Klingner. Um, you mentioned earlier uh, threat model, agile threat modeling. And um, I have come across a tool called Threatgile, which means threat modeling as a code. Have you seen that? I have, yes. I mean, I mean this is, I mean, I know that this is not, while it is automatic threat modeling, but it needs uh, manual oversight. But what is your opinion about this? I mean, threat modeling as code developers can easily support here. I love it. Um, and if you're writing code, and I think Threadgel is Python. So if you're writing code in Python, it's awesome. If you're writing code in, I don't know, Java, it's a little less awesome. And if what you're doing is deploy an SAP database on Windows, then it's a little less helpful. I, I'm excited by the explosion of interesting and different new tools. And so I encourage people to, um, to experiment, to explore. 
And there's a, by the way, there's an opportunity, much like I maintain a page of games, it would be awesome if someone maintained a page that had all of these emerging tools on them to help people find them. Um, and I, I haven't seen such a page. I would love it if someone else picked up that bit of work. Um, if so, if you're looking to help the community, that's a, there's an opportunity there. I, I believe there's some GitHub page with an awesome threat modeling list listing some of the codes at least, some of the tools at least. I, I would think that page would be even more awesome if the author did more than catalog, but talk about things like this is it maintained, um, this, is, this is still in use. Um, there's, there's a lot on that page that hasn't been touched in 10 or 15 years, and it's not clear to me what makes it awesome. Okay. So any more question in the audience? Because then maybe I have a last question because I don't see any other question on Slack. Um, you said that in an agile world, you threat model um, in sprint code. But for us, um, we sometimes get to a legacy code base where, I mean, this in sprint code approach maybe works for a greenfield project. But what would be your recommendation if you just, well, get into a, a project which is running for five or 10 years? That's, you have to give me the hard one at the end, huh? Sorry. Um, so first, ask, what are we working on? What can go wrong? What are we going to do about it? And think about this in terms of the change energy available for the project. One of the unfortunate things about threat modeling, something that's 10, and I'll go a little older, 10, 20 years old, is that nobody wants to touch it. Nobody wants to try and replace it because it's got so much accumulated integration work that touching it is just a huge can of worms every time we do. And so, I like to think about it in terms of what are the things that I can change that accept the reality of we're not going to rebuild this. And so containerization, so I can easily redeploy it, um, micro-segmentation, so that when an attacker breaks in, they can't get out to other systems and we detect them trying to do lateral movement, really good backups. And so each of these is focused on what can we do about it? Because um, you're right, you know, the, a system which is out there for a long time is expensive to make changes to. And so I, I try and figure out, do I need to go yell at the CEO? Always popular move, right? <laughs> um, or, or can I do something that is more appropriate? And so if, it, if that was the last question, if I can just close out by saying, do you have one more? No, I think this was the last question. Yes. Okay. So if I can just close by saying that I do this threat modeling work because it is the thing that I have found has the absolute highest impact that I can have. These really simple questions of what are we working on? What can go wrong? What are we going to do about it? Did we do a good job? can transform how you engage with projects. And so as you leave this awesome tech day and go have a beer, go to your weekend and then come back on Monday, I wanna encourage you to start asking these or continue asking these simple questions because 
they are how you get leverage and build better systems, deploy more secure systems. And so thank you again for the chance to join you here today. I appreciate it. Thank you.